Okay, the webinar is started. Welcome to IDEA 2 IPO. And hello, my name is Jennifer. IDEA 2 IPO has been holding tech startup events in Silicon Valley for many, many years. IDEA 2 IPO launched officially on February 1st, 2010. At that time, we had no members and no events on our calendar. At this stage, we have over 100,000 members among all of our meetup groups all around the world. We have organized, promoted, and produced over 2,459 events. We are the most active, most prolific startup event organization in the history of Silicon Valley, bar none. We organize and produce venture capital panels, legal workshops, and more. These days, we are 100% online and we hold events nearly every day of the week. Please check out our schedule at ideatoipo.com. Our featured speaker tonight is Roger Royce, one of the top startup and venture capital attorneys in Silicon Valley. And he is passionate about helping entrepreneurs succeed. Ladies and gentlemen, Roger Royce. Roger, take it away. Hey, well, thank you, Jennifer. Thank you, Idea to IPO, for hosting this event on Zoom. I am happy to be here. And uh, I am, as Jennifer said, I'm Roger Royce. I'm a partner with the law firm of Haynes and Boone, resident in the Palo Alto office, at least theoretically. Uh, when we stop sheltering, I will be for real. Um, and um, which is, for those of you who are not from California, that's Silicon Valley. And I do primarily uh, merging growth and venture capital, uh, meaning startups. And most of that is on the startup side, although I also do some fund formation. So um, I can see both sides of the aisle. So today the topic of course is how to split the pie, raise money and reward contributors. I got lots of good content. I got some new content. You know, we keep coming up with new content the more we do these things. But I have a couple of housekeeping items first. Number one, we're live streaming on Facebook yet again. We've just totally got that nailed. I know how to do that now. So uh, all of my friends are going to uh, see this presentation. Uh, and if you ask questions, I'll even hear your questions How about that. Um, I want you to know that this is being recorded. For those of you that want to uh, take this home and uh, listen to it over and over again and put it on a continuous loop, you know, <clears throat> maybe have it be the ringtone on your answering machine or something like that. You can do that because we're going to be sing sending you the link to the video and you'll find it posted on the Idea to IPO uh, YouTube site. You'll also find it posted on my personal website, uh, rogerroyce.com. You'll find it posted on my personal YouTube page, uh, which you can find if you just you know, search my name on YouTube. So it'll be, you know, we're not hiding. We're, we're easy to find. So before we get started, uh, I'm kind of nos nosy. I want to know who's out there. So I'm going to do a poll here. And I'd like you to tell me who is in the audience. Are you a startup entrepreneur? Are you a more mature established company? Are you an investor? Uh, are you a service provider like me? Um, government, media, press, academia, any students? I'm gonna leave this open for a We've got, uh, I'll wait till we get about 90% voted and then I'll close it. Um, wow, it's mostly startup entrepreneurs. Um, yeah, heavily startup entrepreneurs. You know, we used to do these events live, uh, but for the last seven months now, we've been doing them virtually. Uh, and since we moved to a virtual format, we not only get our Silicon Valley audience, we also get an international audience. Uh, an audience from, from all over the world. Okay, we've got 78% startup entrepreneurs and i um, gonna go ahead and end the polling. But I'm really nosy. I wanna know where you guys are from too. Like I say, we get an international audience. So where are you from? Are you from California? Are you from Silicon Valley? Are you from someplace else in this big country? Are you from Asia? Um, I don't know. I think I want to recount to this poll. I don't trust these results. I think this is fake news. I think these were fraudulently tabulated. I don't believe there's 77% investors out there. Uh, I think, or, or entrepreneurs. I think there's a lot more investors. 
Okay, what do we got here? Um, about half Silicon Valley, half other United States. We've got, um, again, not very many from Western Europe. Yes, I know it's late there, but that's no excuse. By the way, does anybody know what the Swiss flag is? If you know what it is, chat me, and I will send to you a free copy of my book, Dead on Arrival, How to Avoid the Legal Mistakes That Could Kill Your Startup. I don't know what the best thing is about Switzerland, but I do know that its flag is a big plus. If anybody gets that joke, chat me and you get a copy of my book. All righty, and digital, a digital copy, by the way, unless you wanna come down and pick up a hard copy. Okay, about half Silicon Valley, about a third other North America, and um, everybody else is dispersed throughout every place except Western Europe. Good to know. Okay, I'm going to end the polling. All righty, so before we get started, um, let me send to you, if you wanna get a hold of me afterwards, like I say, we're gonna circulate the slides, we're gonna circulate the video. Um, uh, all registrants are going to get a free digital copy of my book, don't worry. Um, but um, you're also, if you wanna reach me, you can reach me on LinkedIn. So I'm going to send to you uh, my LinkedIn information. Now you notice what I just did, I used the chat feature. So if there's something I need to know right away, you know, feel free to chat me. Uh, if there is a question that you have, please put it in the Q&A box because I'm going to speak until eight o'clock Pacific time for about one hour. And then I'm going to open it up to questions. I'm going to take questions uh, for the next 30 minutes. Okay, we found somebody who figured out why that joke is funny because that is what is on the Swiss flag. It's a big plus sign. All right, you guys win. All righty, let's, uh, let's uh, oh, one last thing. Like Rob says, he does these every day. I don't do this every day, but I do speak here a lot. You can see me again in two weeks, same time, same station, same place, uh, talking about top 10 legal mistakes for startup companies. Okay, now with that, here comes the trickiest part of the evening. This is where I have to share my screen. So um, I need some verbal feedback here. You see my slides. Yes, somebody says. Okay, that's not verbal, but it is on chats. Okay, good. Thank you. Wow, what a good audience. You guys, you guys are way better than the last audience I had. You're already a lot smarter than those guys. I kept asking for feedback and they wouldn't tell me if they could see my slides. So big plus. All right, how to split the pie, raise money and reward contributors. This is not legal advice, although as you know, one of my personality defects is that I am a lawyer. So I am going to talk about law and experience and things that I've seen, but we're gonna try and get a little bit further down to the nitty gritty of what I see people do when they form their company and decide how we're gonna divide up the equity. Uh, how are we gonna split this up? How are we gonna decide who gets what? And that's what this is mostly about, how to split the pie, how to re reward these people. How do we give them something that's going to keep them motivated and engaged uh, in the company so they can stick around until we have a very successful exit? <clears throat> how to split the pie, reward contributors. All right. So let's start with kind of my fundamental triangle here. When I think of a startup company, when I think of the people, I mean, there's people, there's technology, and there's money. We're talking mostly about people today, although we are going to talk about raising investment towards the end here. But <clears throat> among the people element of this, uh, I think we should think of having founders, investors, and service providers. And I'm going to split it up exactly that way when we're talking about how we're going to split this pie between the founders, the investors, and the consultants, the advisors, all the other people, all the other participants that might be involved in your company. So first, let me give you a cautionary tale. Uh, the case of Zipcar, I'm not speaking out of turn. This is already widely known, it's published, it's all over the internet, but it is a great story of a startup company that started on a 50-50 handshake deal. They did what we call equal split. Uh, Co-founder number one, who shall remain nameless, uh, did all the work, built the company, turned it into the humongous success that it is today. Uh, co-founder number two um, did not get quite as engaged uh, as co-founder number one uh, and did not contribute very much. Um, the co-founder number one uh, did not uh, hide the fact that she was unhappy about that uh, 
and certainly uh, said that it certainly contributed. It was a negative factor in the company. Now this is Zipcar. You know, they're a superstar among startups. They were able to overcome that. They were able to go on and be successful. Um, usually what happens in that scenario, is something is messed up that bad on formation that, that there's a, you know, there's, there's not vesting, there's, there's not an appropriate split, there's no performance metrics. Usually if something gets messed up that bad, that company is going to fail. Um, or it's going to have a very difficult negotiation and recapitalize and restructure. It's not a good event in any scenario. So I want to keep you from making that mistake, show you what to do to do something a little bit more, I guess, a little bit more, um, um, a little bit more productive and positive. Now, keep in mind, we're talking about splitting up founders equity. So um, if you're a sole founder out there, you don't have this problem for now, at least among the founders. But keep in mind that um, successful companies oftentimes have co-founders. Look at the successful companies over the last several years, even the big ones, right? Google, Facebook, Microsoft, you know, the big companies, they start with co-founders. Um, so I'm aiming this portion of the discussion at the companies with co-founders. But don't worry, I got something for you sole founders coming up as well. But we're going to talk about the co-founders right now. There's a couple of concepts I want to go through. Um, First of all, how much equity should people have? And you all have this uncomfortable discussion with your co-founders. When you walk into a room, sometimes people used to walk into my conference room when people were allowed in my conference room and they'd sit down and they'd say, we wanna form the company. And I'd say, that's great. I say, who's the founders? And they'd say, we are. And I'd say, and uh, have you decided how you're gonna split the equity? Uh, oftentimes the answer was no. Oftentimes it was equally, it was almost never any of these other things. So that's number one. Number two, I'm talking about vesting, which is really sort of a correction if we got it really wrong on the equity split. Uh, and then thirdly, we're gonna talk about some of the other uh, aspects of equity investment. So let's talk first about this idea of equal split. That is probably the most common way um, of splitting up equity. You should be seeing a slide with a quote by Professor Noam Wasserman, uh, who is a professor at Harvard Business School. He's written quite a bit on what he calls dynamic split. And the most common way of splitting up equity is usually equal split. It also, according to Professor Wasserman, is probably the worst way. And here's one reason, but what else would you do? In fact, he has done some pretty good studies, mathematical studies that show that founders and companies that split their equity up equally are going to be giving up, if they're successful, about 20 percentage points in valuation along the way. Why is that? Well, just you know, think about it. It means somebody is not being sufficiently motivated. Somebody is, uh, you know, is getting a free ride, but mostly it's because the investors don't like it. They're going to punish the company uh, if they think that the founders got it wrong on the split. So this stuff is important. So even though an equal split, um, is comfortable, you know, it's easy. You can avoid that difficult conversation in my conference room or otherwise. Uh, it's gonna cost you, it's gonna cost you if that's not the right answer. It's gonna cost you in some legal ways as well. And um, let me give you the example that I see quite frequently. It's that's the 50-50 company. Um, now I'm gonna tell you throughout kind of the business reasons you don't wanna do that or I'll let Professor Wasserman tell you, you can read his white paper. It's pretty extensive on all the business reasons why equal splits are not a good idea. The legal reason is that you have the potential for deadlock. And that might not sound like a lot to you right now when everybody's jazzed about the company and you're all on board and you seek consensus and you're in that echo chamber of all thinking alike and sounding alike, uh, but you're gonna get a tough decision where you don't agree. It's just going to happen. I promise you, it's going to happen. Um, if you're a 50-50 company, how are you going to resolve that decision? So if I can't talk you out of being a 50-50 company, or maybe that is the right equity split, uh, I at least want to put in some protections so that you don't kill your company by having a bad structure. Uh, the most easy one, of course, is to have a three-member board of directors. The board uh, manages the firm, manages the company, and makes all the business decisions. If you've got a three-member board, you can't be deadlocked by definition. Uh, because two of the members will have to vote, or maybe one shareholder can have two votes. But you get the idea. You need to have a you need to have an odd number on your board of directors so you can resolve deadlocks. Here's another way uh, that we often do. In fact, I usually do all of these. 
uh, or a combination of different methods. Another way is to have an appraisal process to say, hey, look, uh, if we get into a 50-50 deadlock, uh, I'm allowed to sell my shares to the company um, and you'll buy me out at appraised value. That looks so good on paper. It is so elegant. I mean, when I draft these valuation provisions, it's like poetry. It's legal poetry. It reads so well. In practice, however, it doesn't work that way. It gets so ugly because you either like that appraised value or you hate it. And if you like it, you point to the agreement and my beautiful prose. If you hate it, you challenge that appraisal and all the reasons why it's screwed up and why you got to go, go get another one. And all of this is costing you a lot of money. This is the confrontation and the expense and the argument that you were trying to avoid. And now you're back into the thick of it. So in practice, it's not that great. In theory, it works well. Third thing is what we call a blind option. And I'll oftentimes put this in agreements if we got a 50-50 deal. And that's where we say, look, if we get into, here's a list of decisions. If we can't agree on this stuff, and it's big stuff, sell the company, go bankrupt, you know, big stuff, do a financing. If we can't agree, then either one of us has the right to make an offer to the other to either buy my shares or I will or sell me your shares, but it's at the same price. And you make the offer, you set the price. And that keeps everybody honest. That's a blind option. It's been around as long as I've been practicing law, which is, um, I don't know, four or five years now, I think. And then finally, one thing I want you to know about, uh, if you're unfortunate enough to be a California corporation, we do a whole presentation on this. I'll be talking about it in two weeks on where you should incorporate. But California, it is surprisingly easy for a disgruntled shareholder to commence an involuntary dissolution of a corporation. And that is ugly. That is ugly because of one third shareholder, they just say, look, we got internal dissension, we're deadlocked, and this is a decision that keeps the company from moving forward, or a whole other list of reasons. Oppression, they always plead oppression, but until you've been through that process, if you've been through it once, you don't wanna go through it again because all that goodwill just goes away. It's like somebody putting a gun to your head. Um, so there are really good reasons not to be in this scenario. So what can we do not to be in that scenario? Let's talk about a couple of them. Noam Wasserman, the professor from Harvard, he likes the dynamic split idea. What is dynamic split? What does dynamic mean? It means it's always changing. So instead of being 50-50, it's going to be 50-50. Um, it's it's going to be whatever our relative inputs are worth, which might be 50-50, but probably won't. And that's going to change every day because every day I'm going to spend more time or less time than you working, or I'm going to put more or less cash in you or more or less IP. And we're going to get together at the front end and we're just going to value all of these inputs. And every day, you know, like a timekeeper, we're going to keep track of our inputs. And we're going to do this right up to the point where we actually have a valuation event. And that'll be something like um, a financing, revenue, um, something like that, some valuation event. And at that point, we're going to take a picture, stop the clock, take a picture and see what our relative inputs add up to. And that's going to give us our outputs. The output is your share ownership. All right. So it's like a little converter. It's like a converter machine. I'm going to change this slide and put a little machine. I'll put like a, like a wood chip or something there because it converts inputs into shares. Uh, and at the end, that's what we get. So that, that's the scenario. Um, I just want to warn you, um, there are issues around this. You have to be careful about this. First of all, uh, these outputs are securities. Even the promise of giving an output is a security. You have to comply with securities laws. And it's surprisingly easy not to comply with securities laws these days, um, but uh, devastatingly bad if you mess that up. Secondly, there are tax consequences. And just at a high level, I'll tell you the way people get away with this. It's kind of like that's Hollywood sort of thing, Silicon Valley. Everybody just closes one eye and looks the other way and assumes that startup company stock isn't worth anything until you do that financing and the IRS won't care. Uh, that works really great until they do care. And trust me, I've been there. Uh, or the other way is that we tie this to some sort of very complex vesting provision. I've done it both ways. There's ways of making this work. All I want to tell you today is there are issues to be careful about. This is, this is complicated. You get a good result, you get an accuracy, but, but you know, in law, oftentimes, the, how good a result you get depends on how much complexity you can live with. This is complex. 
There are some great calculators online. The Founders Pi calculator uh, created by Dembler uh, is a very kind of simplified version. What I just gave you was a dynamic split. The Founders Pi calculator is what I would call a, a subjective formula clause, or I'm sorry, objective formula clause. And basically, uh, it's, it's fixed because you just decide what the split is at the front end. It doesn't change every day, but still it's determined by formula. And if you go onto the calculator, you figure out you, there's five categories, idea, business plan, domain expertise, so important, commitment and risk and responsibilities. And we weight all those. And then you give each one a value zero to 10. And you just, here, I'll show you, show you what it looks like. There's the Founders Pie Calculator example from Frank Demler, professor at Tepper School of Business, Carnegie Mellon. There's an example. We total up all these points. Uh, we weighted them. We decided what they were worth. We decided what Founder 1 was putting in, what Founder 2 was putting in, weighted them up, and we came up with our percentages. I like it. I like it because it's, it's, it's an objectively determinable formula. Um, but if you wanted to get a little more precise, here's another example of a dynamic split. This is called the Grunt Fund. You can find it at slicingpie.com. It's much more involved. It's a series of Excel spreadsheets. Um, the Grunt Fund site itself will tell you how to weight all of these factors. For example, cash is worth four times what your time is worth, uh, you know, given your, uh, even, even using opportunity costs for purposes of, of this formula. So everybody enters, um, uh, what we want to do is get to a spreadsheet where everybody has entered all other inputs. We add them all up. We total them. We get a grand total. We figure out the percentages. That's your slice of the pie. That's your equity percentage. Uh, there's a detail that supports all of this that you'll see here. You can take a look at this later when you get the slides or better yet, go onto the website and play with it. Speaking of websites, there's other methods. And if I were going to do this, if I were you, I would find about three of them that converge onto the same answer. And I'd say, poof, that's got to be it. Three people agree, right? If three people tell you you've had too much to drink, it's time to go home and go to bed. But two people tell you that you should have 30% and not 70%, it's time to take your 30%. The GUST, um, uh, co oh, I missed the word. It's not C founder, it's co founder equity split calculator. Uh, you'll find it online, cofounders.gust.com. It's a series of questions. You answer them, it emails you an answer. It says, here you go, this is what you, it's a long series of questions, but they're very insightful, very good. A lot of them I never would have thought of. Uh, the Founders Institute has an equity split spreadsheets. It's uh, you know similar, uh, a little different, little different focus, check it out. And of course, here's the Wasserman paper with uh, Hillerman. Uh, they put out a working paper that's a little more theoretical and actual practical, but it is an interesting read. And then finally, and none of that works, you might just go to couples therapy. You know, just, you know, I don't know what else to tell you. Just sit down with your therapist therapist, and uh, complain for an hour and see if they can tell you um, what you should do. By the way, if you don't use any of these split methods, you might need couples therapy at, at the end of this process when, uh, when the company, when the founders break up. That's it for founders, okay? I talked fast, but we're 23 minutes into this, so I wanna move on to everybody else. Um, now we got advisors. So we got founders, we got, and we've got advisors. That's my next big category here I wanna talk about. So you've, if you've seen me before, if you've heard this before, you know that a really successful startup, it not only has founders, it also has a lot of other people. You know, it takes a village, I guess. I just made that up just now, by the way, it takes a village. You can say you heard it here first. It takes a village to create a startup. So part of that village is going to be advisors. What are advisors? So the advisors, they're not founder level. They're not even consultant level. These are people who have some particular expertise that your company needs or wants or could really use. Sometimes advisors have technical expertise. Oftentimes they're good at sales and marketing. Sometimes your advisors are just, they just know a lot of investors. Uh, oftentimes they're really good at helping you, you know, build out a pitch deck or something like that. Whatever it is, they're not there for the long term, they're there for the short term. Um, so a couple of questions. How much stock do we get? What do I give the advisor, first of all? Um, I'll answer that one. That's easy. You give them stock or options. You're a startup, you don't have a lot of cash, you need to give that to me uh, to do your legal work, which so you got to give your stock or your options to the advisors, right? That's first, how much do I give them? And how do I hold their feet to the fire? Uh, and how long do I make them best? 
So I want to give you a tool here. If you go online to the Founders, Inst Founders Institute, you can find the FAST agreement. It's the Founders Agreement for Equity. I forget what they call it, but it's, it's, it's FAST, but it basically is an advisor agreement. And this has a matrix. And on that matrix, you find out where the advisor is. It varies between 0.2% and 1% per advisor. And the earlier you are and the least, less involved the advisor is, the less they get. The later you are and the more involved or more valuable the advisor is, the more you get. Now, this is rough. This is general. This is a good template for, for your advisors. I will tell you that I've worked with companies. Um, um, I had a company recently. They got an A-list Hollywood movie star to be an advisor. The guy did nothing but lend his name to the company because they were a social, you know, socially responsible company. Um, and, and we had to give him four or five percent as an advisor. That's off the charts. It's off the charts for an advisor. But that was a really big name. It's a really good endorsement to have. Um, <clears throat> by the way, next week we're going to talk about all the FTC rules around that. But for today. You know, all I want to say, it's a, it's sort of a, a thing of art. A lot of times investor advisors, you know, celebrity Silicon Valley investor advisors, they'll get upwards of 2%. But this is the general matrix that you want to follow. So take a look at, at that, uh, that uh, fast agreement, especially uh, the charts on the back on the exhibits that will explain to you how to split up the equity. So what do you give the advisor then? Now we know how much they're going to get. What are they going to get? Um, and by the way, when we talk percentages, I'm always talking a percentage of the issued and outstanding shares of the company, okay? That's what I mean. When you incorporate your company, we're gonna talk in two weeks about this, you're gonna authorize a certain number of shares. I'm not talking about a percentage of your authorized shares. That's a made up make-believe number, all right? That's as fake as those polls that we just took, right? Now those polls were real, by the way, but that is a made up number. And that number, um, uh, is only a top limit to how many shares can be issued. To know how much of a company you own, you want to know what percentage of the issued and outstanding shares on a fully diluted basis are. Now I added some more words, fully diluted. What does that mean? That means that we assume every option gets exercised, every convertible gets converted, uh, all of that stuff. Uh, as if every Friday you promise stock to actually has that stock, that's fully diluted. Okay, that's the metric. Now, what do we give to them? There's really three or four ways we can do this. Uh, everybody in Silicon Valley, more people in this valley probably know what an option is than know what a Miranda right is. And they know they should have them, even though just like a Miranda right, they might not know exactly what it is. Uh, but everyone loves options. That's, that's why every company loves to use options. Uh, there's other good reasons. I, I would argue that this valley was probably built on option plans, uh, but that was a long time ago. So anyway, Options, that is just a right to buy stock, okay? It is a right to buy stock and under current law, current regulations, it's a right to purchase stock at today's valuation, all right? So you give me a right today to buy stock for a dollar a share, because let's say a, do a dime a share, that's a better option price, because that's what you're worth, 10 cents a share. And when I exercise that right, meaning I actually buy the stock, say it's worth a dollar a share, I don't pay a dollar five years from now, four years from now, I pay 10 cents a share, that's my right. That's my option privilege. Okay, that's what an option is. What a great deal. You get the share and all the upside of the company, it doesn't cost you a dime. You're not gonna exercise unless the stock goes up in value, right? And, all right, so you've got no downside risk and you've got all of the upside. Great deal, great deal. That's why options are so popular. Uh, and that's why they're most often used as equity compensation for people. My rule of thumb is under 1%, give them options. Um, more than 1%, I will look towards restricted stock. What is restricted stock? Instead of just giving someone a right to buy stock, you actually sell them the stock, right? They buy the stock, okay? And you're an early stage startup, so the price is super low, there's no valuation yet, so we keep the price real low. Once again, um, I'm going to tell you that uh, the IRS generally has a different view of valuation than you and the investor and your barber who you went down to ask about uh, the last time you could get a haircut thinks about the value of your company. By the way, I had that happen to me once. I had a client come in to me, he didn't like my advice. And I said, we said, well, you go think about it. And he came back two weeks later. I said, what'd you decide? He said, you know, I talked it over with my barber and we decided that stock's only worth a penny a share. 
I said, fine, whatever. <laughs> uh, so however you come up with that value, it's going to be low until you actually do a financing. So you can do an RSU, or you can do a restricted stock grant. RSUs, I'll talk about it because they're fun to talk about. You're never going to use it as long as you're an early stage startup. Um, but an RSU is a contractual right. Where when you vest, that means you get a grant of stock. It just gets granted to you. At that point, you are taxable on that grant at its fair market value. If that stock in a publicly traded company, that's not such a bad deal. You can go sell the stock, pay the tax. If it's stock in a startup, you're stuck with it. And that, that pretended value that you got the stock at might never become real value unless the company exits. It's not something you want to do in a startup. Uh, it's fun to talk about, and it works for bigger companies, not for your startup company. And phantom plan units, phantom units, we also call them incentive units. Some people don't like phantom units, you know, <clears throat> especially so close to Halloween. So I'll call them incentive units. Uh, and what it is, it's a contractual right. The unit that we're granting you it gets the same distributions, dividends, and uh, proceeds of liquidation exit sale as if it were a share of stock. That's a phantom unit. It's not a real share of stock, it just mimics. So phantom stock, we sometimes call it. It mimics stock or incentive stock. Um, no tax on grant. The shareholder is not a shareholder. They don't get the vote. No fiduciary duties owed to them, just like with an option. No fiduciary duties owed to an option E. That's big. I'm going to tell you why before we leave here tonight. Um, not an ERISA plan. It's not a deferred compensation plan if it's structured right. Uh, there's a whole lot of benefits. It's just so simple. The problem is it's not an option. So it's a story. So when you go into your company and you tell people, hey, you know, my lawyer came, he's a great guy. He came up with this idea, phantom units, phantom stock. And they're gonna say, well, gee, I don't know, my neighbor got options. How come I gotta get these, you know, these phony phantom units? So it's a hard story, story to tell, but it's a great deal for the company. It's not a great tax result though. Everything is taxed at the highest rate ordinary income with an option. The option E has an opportunity to get capital gain. They exercise the option if they hold it for a while. Uh, with an NSO, they can get capital gain on the future appreciation. With an ISO, they can get capital gain on the whole thing. Um, I'm going to come back to this extended NS. Well, I'll just tell you what the concept is. That's the idea. Most NSO stock options, they're going to expire within 30 or 90 days after you leave the company. Okay, so you got to exercise within that time. Most employees, in my experience, don't do that. Um, they'll either stay with the company until the company sells, um, or they'll leave and they'll let the option expire. If they thought the company were going to sell, they wouldn't be leaving, right? So what a lot of companies have gotten to do over the years, especially lately, is extend the exercise period and say, hey, after you leave, you can exercise for a year after you're gone. We're going to give you an extended exercise period. Kind of defeats the purpose of the option, right? Remember, we want to retain and reward employees. We want to keep them around. Don't do it. I, I discourage companies from doing it, and then you'll go do it anyway. So with these units, remember what I was saying about valuation. I want to spend a lot of don't want to spend a lot of time on this um, because not many people understand it, uh, not even a lot of lawyers, but there's a way, suppose that company's a little further down the road, they've done a financing, they've got a value, they got a 409A valuation, they valued their stock options. Well, gee, if we grant that stock to the person, they have taxable income equal to the value of the stock. If we sell that stock to the person, they're gonna pay for it. If we sell it to them for a promissory note, they're gonna have to pay the note at some point. So we use a, if we do a non-recourse note, that means they don't ever have to pay the note. Uh, the, the only pay the note if the company is successful, that's a non-recourse note. The IRS treats that the same as an option. You lose all the tax benefits. So this thing called a, a partial recourse promissory note. It would take me a while to go through it. I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to tell you that with a little creative thinking, you can bridge that gap. Vesting. The answer to the question, who should vest, is everybody. Every single service provider in your company should vest. Okay, if, if you don't make them vest now, your investors are going to make them vest later. Um, that includes the founders, three to five years for founders, usually three, sometimes four. There's a lot of founders that want to duke it out. And by the way, I call that preemptive vesting. Um, uh, for advisors, usually two years. Why so short for advisors? Because advisors, you shouldn't need them for more than two years. You know, you want them there for a very short project. And then acceleration. That's the idea that you get more shares vested 
you know, something happens, like if you um, get fired without cause, three founders, two of you have ganged up on me and fired me. Uh, you don't want to do that. That single trigger acceleration, investors hate that. Um, what instead you want to do is double trigger uh, um, acceleration. That means if somebody gets fired within a certain amount of time with a company being sold, well, gee, that's not your fault. We'll give you some or all of your shares accelerated vesting. So that means when we do the sale and you get your Microsoft stock in exchange for your startup company stock, your Microsoft stock is going to be fully vested, even though your startup company stock that you exchanged for it uh, was only half vested uh, if you get fired within six months, that kind of thing. So if you're the CFO of your startup and you think you might be a little redundant, I don't know, I hear Microsoft's got a pretty good financial apartment. They might not need you, you know? So you might want to negotiate for double trigger acceleration. I've talked a lot about that here today. I won't talk more about it now. I do want to mention milestones. Um, for advisors in particular, uh, you want to have milestones. So it's not just two years. You want your advisor to deliver. Why is that? Because unlike an employee and a consultant, they're not showing up at your office every day, right? I guess nobody's showing up at my office every day anyway, uh, but they're not showing up on their computer every day during the sheltering. Um, they're not working every day. So you want milestones, you want metrics, you want to know how, you know, you want some way to gauge them because you don't really know when they quit. You don't know when they stop. So, you know, it's, it's two years provided that you get me this many leads, we close this many sales, you know, we get this patent issued, whatever, not, don't, don't do patent issued, but maybe filed, something like that, something within their control, a milestone. Uh, and then finally, I do want to mention the fire the founder game that we play here in Silicon Valley. It's um, it's like a, it's like a American Idol um, <laughs> founders that and, and and trust me, I get it. You know, I know you have to be slightly delusional to do what you're doing. Um, you have to suspend reality to go out and change the world and convince people to think like you. But here's one world you're not going to change is the idea that you're going to be the CEO forever. If you're Bill Gates, you'll last a long time. You know, if you're Zuckerberg, you'll last a long time. But everybody else is going to be very vulnerable, very vulnerable um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, the biggest reason is that the company should, if it gets investment, it should become a different kind of company. And the skill set, that risk taking, you know, um, hubris that you brought to your startup to get it off the ground and get from zero to one, that is not the skill set you need once you've done a couple rounds of financing. At that point, at some point, you start have to protecting what you have instead of you know swinging for the fences uh, every time. And that usually takes a different kind of person, maybe someone a little more process oriented. So the founder will, will get replaced at some point in the company's life. Why am I telling you this? Because forewarned is forearmed. Uh, you need to think about your package and your vesting restrictions with that in mind. Now, what's the big deal? It's only three or four year vesting. I can last that long. Well, I got bad news for you. Um, three and four year vesting is a cruel joke. Uh, every time you do a round of financing, the VCs have an opportunity to say, you know, we need you to invest, man. You know, we need you to stick around a little while longer. Um, so, you know, we're just going to invest your shares and be another four years. I see that over and over and over and over again. Uh, I'm not going to go into it at length here. I talked about it a lot two weeks ago, three weeks ago, but just keep that in mind as a founder um, that you need to have some protections built in if something should happen to you. And that's where double trigger comes in uh, or something like that, or some form of accelerated vesting or at least know that you're gonna have enough shares that you're happy with what you've done when you leave. Holy cow, I'm only halfway through my slides, not even. A Couple of other things, class F super voting stock. Again, we're still on this topic. How are we gonna retain and incentivize people, reward contributors? Class F common stock, super voting stock made famous by Facebook, Google, and Snap. This is the idea that the um, stock, some class of stock, because uh, all common stock is equal, but some common is more equal than other stock. This is the idea that class F common stock has more voting rights than other stock. I think Clint Eastwood said that, and he? he said, said, we're all equal, but I'm more equal than you. Okay, chat me if you know the answer to that trivia question. 
Anyway, class said that works really well until the investors get involved. Um, I don't think they're going to want to see it. I try to discourage. Um, I try to discourage uh, founders from doing that. Uh, but um, you know, sometimes they'll do it anyway and just hang on to it as long as they can. Don't get. By the way, don't get too attached to any of the stuff that you put in place before you get an investor. Uh, because the VC will make a pancake out of whatever you've done. In other words, you're going to start all over and rebuild your cap table the way they want it to be. Um, you know, it's it's uh, <clears throat> they have the money, they make the rules kind of thing, the golden rule. Talk about a couple of other things I want to mention. And again, I'm going to geek out a little bit on some legal stuff. Right of first refusal. Um, you know, it's just so easy to go online, download forms. Um, and uh, issue stock and, uh, you know, you mess up the securities laws. All right, if, 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 if I get to you before the SEC does, I can fix that. Um, otherwise, it might not be too pretty. Um, but if you mess up this stuff, these are contractual. You got to get everybody to agree or your company's done. So one thing is you always want to write a first refusal. What does that mean? It's a role first, we often call it. It means that before any of the, your co-founders can sell their shares in the company, they have to offer those shares back to the company at the price that they could get out in the market. Um, that means the company can control who owns their shares. As a practical matter, it means they can't sell their shares because who wants to go to the trouble of making an offer if the company's just going to buy them? If the company doesn't buy them, then the other founders will buy them. And if the other founders don't buy them, then the other investors, if you have them, will, will buy them. So that's the right of first refusal. You sometimes see carve outs for like transfers to family trusts and kids and if you die or stuff like that. But for the most part, um, that's a role for very important. Um, people don't pay enough. The big mistake is to not have it at all. The second mistake is people who, um, um, who pay no attention to it. Okay, or who, who pay attention to it, but don't give enough attention to it. In other words, you ought to think this through. Like what's going to happen in various scenarios if so-and-so leaves? Do we need their shares to maintain control? Uh, if the company doesn't buy them, is that other founder or that other investor going to buy them? How could this play out? You got to use a little game theory in this. Uh, you got to use a lot of game theory in this. But uh, so keep that in mind. This is a more important clause than you think. It looks like boilerplate, but I've seen it be a very, very, very important clause to a company. Lockups just means that everyone's going to agree not to sell their shares after an IPO until the investment bankers say you can. Co-sale, drag along, those are the rights. That's the idea If somebody sells, everybody has to sell. You can either drag people along with you because you found a buyer, investors get that, not you the founder usually. Uh, or if you found a buyer, um, if someone else found a buyer, you can participate in their sale. So you don't have one party getting liquidity and somebody else not. You know, more and more these days in the Valley, I'm seeing this stuff seep into early stage stock purchase agreements. So usually this is stuff that the investors impose on a company later on. It's expensive, has to be lawyered. Some would say over lawyered, but more and more I'm seeing startup companies say, yeah, we want co-sell rights. We want drag along rights. I want to be able to drag them. I want him to give me a co-sell, stuff like that. Again, I tend to avoid it because I just don't think you're worth much until you do that round of financing. And at that point, you're going to get all the bells and whistles. So same with the buy sell. <clears throat> Why bother? It's going to go away at financing and your company is not going to be worth anything until then anyway. But a more mature company that's not going to do a venture finance and a buy sell is a pretty cool thing. Uh, it's not on here, but I want to mention, I want to tell you a little bit of a trap here. Uh, there's a recent case. I think it's Dropbox. Uh, company has a bylaw provision, has all this stuff in it. So we didn't even have to go out and negotiate it. In fact, the shareholders didn't even know they signed up for it. <laughs> um, it's just sitting in their bylaws and some dusty set of bylaws and some you know, file drawer uh, that hasn't been opened in seven months now. Um, and the courts have regularly ruled that, hey, you buy stock in a company, you take it subject to your bylaws. So I'm seeing that happen again. I saw that 20 years ago, now I'm seeing it come back. Uh, people stuffing this stuff in bylaws and uh, hoping nobody notices. I don't really like that practice. I don't care what the courts say. I wanna have an agreement. I want everybody on the same page. You know, honesty is the best policy. I want full transparency. This is what you're signing up for, Haas. 
Cap table, we're gonna go fast. Cap table is exactly what you think it is. There's an example of a, this is a real cap table. I took, you know, names have been changed to protect the innocent, but you get the idea. Lists all the common, lists all the preferred, uh, has the stock plan, shares, options granted under the plan. Um, I'll let you go through this at your leisure, but you should get familiar with it. Never one of these cells links to another page that will list in detail who all the shareholders are. Why am I pausing on something so basic? It's because these things always are wrong. They always get messed up. Don't ask me how, but they always do. They really take a lot of attention to keep right. There's plenty of good online cap table management tools that will sort of force you not to do what the right answer. I don't believe there is a right answer in, in complex companies with lots of stakeholders, but at least one that everybody agrees on, right? Because it's public. Let me go through, let's simplify this and go through a couple things I wanna mention about this. Here's a typical cap table. Uh, well, it's typical for our purposes. Let me put it that way. I just made it up. 5 million shares to the founders. We got a stock option pool of 2 million. We got a series A. Um, so, and by the way, I'm taking questions at the top of the hour in 14 minutes. So if you've got questions, put them in the Q&A box so we can talk about this. Uh, I need some questions, folks. You know, I. You know, I, I, uh, I got to stick around. I got to fulfill my quota of hours. So let's do some questions in, in about 15 minutes. Founders, 5 million, stock pool, 2 million. Series A, we issued 3 million shares. Series B, we issued 3 million shares. Those are the percentages. And you see on an issued basis, because the stock pool is not fully diluted because those shares haven't been issued. They're basically just promised when people exercise their option. So that's the big idea. And I told you that, so I could tell you this. Suppose a company sells a million dollars of equity at a $4 million pre-money valuation cap. What the heck does that mean? Well, you hear people saying, what's your valuation? What's your valuation? Well, we got to dig a little deeper. Let's say your valuation is $4 million. That's great. Is it pre or is it post money? Post money. Pre-money means that the, that the investor is going to take 20%. 1 million on four pre is 20% because one plus four is five, that's five million posts. So 20% of the post money valuation. So it's 25 pre, I'm sorry, 20% uh, of the valuation. Now, here's why that's significant. There's this thing called a safe that everybody in the world now uses uh, to do the early stage financings. It used to be stock, then it used to be preferred stock, then it was convertible bridge notes, then it was convertible notes, now it's safe or there's a series seed in there someplace. Okay, simple agreement for future equity. It's basically a, technically what it is, is a prepaid forward contract. Think of it as a warrant that's already been paid or an option that's already been paid. So the reason I'm pausing on this is because again, it's really easy for you to go online and download one of these forms. Also very dangerous because they're very simple, but they're, they're, they're simple in that there are only a few pages uh, but they're complex uh, in all the different ways they can go. So what I want you to know for today uh, to take away is that there's a pre-money safe and a post-money safe. Pre-money safe uh, is based on, means that usually a safe agreement says, look, your safe's gonna convert at whatever your next financing value is or this cap, right? This valuation cap. So that valuation cap, is that gonna be a pre-money cap or a post-money cap? If it's pre-money, that means it's just like the example that I said, that we're going to invest based on um, assuming that we have the pre-money plus, you know, that's the amount that we start with plus whatever money gets invested later. The bottom line is that the safe holders are going to get diluted by later safe holders as well as the option pool. Okay, so the safe holders take that because they're investing on a pre-money valuation. So that $4 million, um, that stays at $4 million pre-money, whether that stock pool is zero or a million, right? So that means that the safe holder gets diluted. Post money is the opposite. They say, look, this means that we get X percent of the company after the, after the conversion of all the safes, you know, before the next preferred round, but after the conversion of the safes. And that's the Y Combinator form or the latest form. And the idea is, gee, that's really fair. That is so fair. It's fair because now we all know how much of the company you've given up. Well, okay, I, I'll buy that. But just keep in mind that the safes don't dilute each other. 
and neither does the option pool. They dilute you, the founders. So that's what you're doing if you do a post money save. So be careful about this. You know, the second thing to keep in mind about this is this valuation cap. Uh, they've been coming down this year. I've been seeing that. Uh, investors are getting smarter about that. They've been running numbers. They've been figuring it out. And usually it's angels that buy safes. Um, and I'm hearing lower and lower valuation caps. That means the absolute, that sets the absolute minimum amount, amount of shares that an investor can have when they convert their safe or their convertible. You want that valuation cap to be relatively high. It's not supposed to be the value of the company. It's supposed to be a, a, a ceiling or a protection for the investor in case you have a runaway valuation of the company. So you're not using their money to do something huge to go from zero to 40 million overnight. Um, and the reason that's important is I've seen more than one company sell safes. They just hand them out like candy at Halloween, um, except for this year. I need a better metaphor, but they hand them out freely and um, comes time for the financing. And that's when they finally take stock of their safes and they come to realize that, holy cow, I gave most of my company away. Then the investor realizes it and says, holy cow, there's not enough stock here left for you, the founders. How are we going to incentivize you? You're not taking it out of my share. You can't take it from the safes. You gave it away. I think we'll go on to the next company, you know, next. So don't be in that scenario. Learn how to use a cap table. And I wish I had time to show you this financing spreadsheet that we developed here, but it's a what if spreadsheet. Go through, you put your safes in there and you do a bunch of what ifs. Let's talk a little bit about money uh, and investors. You know, I wanna jump ahead a little bit. We went through all of this two weeks ago. I go through it regularly. Um, I do wanna talk uh, about venture financing. Instead, I wanna talk about management incentive plans, close cousin to the phantom plan. Um, <clears throat> This is the, um, uh, we often call it a carve out plan as well. And this is the idea that when the investor, um, um, I'm sorry, when the company sells, management has to be involved in the sale. So they're gonna get a piece of the proceeds off the top. When would you do this? You took on investors, you gave them liquidation preferences in your company. There's not enough there in that pie for you, the CEO, to go through the bother and trouble. So what we do is we give them a management incentive plan. Like I say, oftentimes called a carve out plan. The problem with that is that, um, um, is that oftentimes it can be a real problem because it takes money away from the other common stockholders. So the reason I'm closing on this is I just want you to know about in Ray Trados. We're in a recession. I've been reading about it in the paper. Uh, that means we're going to have a lot more companies doing sales at low valuations, lower than the preferences. We're going to want to do more of these management incentive plans, and uh, that's going to lead to litigation. Uh, I talked a lot about this two weeks ago. I'll be talking about it again. So let me just mention it. Here's something I did not talk about two weeks ago. What about you guys out there in LLCs, right? You're in limited liability companies. Does any of this stuff apply to you? Yes, they do but with a tax overlay, a very complex tax overlay, I should say. Uh, and the general rule in tax is when we have a capital shift, just like giving stock to somebody, that's a taxable transaction. I got a way around that. It's called a profits interest. It means we can give away something that looks more like an option, but you can get capital gains treatment. It really works well. Think about that if you're an LLC. By the way, if you are an LLC, are you gonna stay an LLC? Probably not, probably not. You're gonna to convert to a corporation at some point because venture capitals, they want corporations, right? They want to invest in corporations. So just keep that in mind. Um, and there's a whole bunch of reasons. Um, you can read all about it in my book, which you all get a free copy of, a digital copy. Um, and you all can have a paper copy, by the way. Um, all you have to do is go to Amazon and buy one. But otherwise, you get a digital copy, and we'll talk all about what happens when you incorporate an LLC. It can be done. I do it all the time. We talked a lot about it last week. We'll talk about it again next week. So let me hit just a couple of other things in the time that we have left. Um, some additional considerations for these people that you're bringing in. Pay attention to the legal issues. Pay attention to the employee versus contractor issues. We just had an election, you might've heard. Um, California uh, had some measures on the ballot. 
Uh, there was a gig economy, actually it was a ride sharing measure um, that passed, which means that California's new law that makes a lot more gig economy employees, gig economy workers employees, it turns them into employees, um, that law doesn't apply to ride share. It applies to everybody else, okay? So yeah, let's pause on that for a minute. Be careful about that. Um, I have to counsel so many companies, especially out-of-state companies that just can't believe it. They just can't believe it. California would not do that to me, would they? Yes, they would. They're gonna treat those service providers as your employees, even though if you're across the border in Nevada or in Oregon or um, what else borders California? Hawaii, I guess, um, technically, maybe, depending how you look at it, depends how good a swimmer you are. If you're on the other side of the border, you get, uh, you get independent contractor treatment, your cost is 30% less to hire that person. You're in California, it's 30% more. Be careful about that when it applies. It doesn't always apply. AB5 does not always apply. When it does, you need to be careful. Why? I've talked about this before. Go Google HomeJoy. $40 million in venture funding. Gig economy company uh, used an algorithm to connect homeowners with, uh, with housekeepers right, and schedule visits. You needed a homeowner, you'd go online, you'd, you'd uh, use the algorithm to get them. Raised 40 million in venture funding, treated them as an independent contractors. They said, hey, look, we're just a platform. You know, they're not nobody's employee. Um, one class action lawsuit shut them down. All right, in California, the presumption is that people are employees. Let me go through this kind of quickly. We have a control test, we have a DOL test, we have a common law test, an EDD test. So it's complicated. And here's the funny thing. You can be an employee for one purpose, but not for another. You can be an employee for this, but not for tax. You can be an employee for, um, you know, depending on who's asking. It could be the Department of Labor. It could be workers' comp, right? It could be the state of California, you know, for wage and hour purposes. Uh, or it could be the Internal Revenue Service, or it could be e the EDD. Here's a real head scratcher for you. You can be tax, you can be treated as an employee for IRS purposes or a contractor for IRS purposes and an employee for, for California franchise tax purposes, believe it or not. Theoretically, in the real world, nobody draws those distinctions. That's why AB5 is so scary. All right. Um, we just finished talking about this. And then finally, um, the other thing that I want you to be careful about, especially with employees, is protecting your intellectual property. Um, make sure that you have a really good confidential information agreement. Um, make sure that you have a good invention assignment. Um, and then be careful because there have been some changes um, that have been made to the law with regard to inventions assignments, invention assignments now. So be careful about that. Make sure um, your invention assignments are up to date and they incorporate all these new changes. So what else should I leave you here with? Just a few things about the exit, right? Because we want to get to a successful exit. That's the whole point of this entire exercise. Um, a couple of things, an exit for you might be taking money off the table, right? It might be doing this transaction right here. How do you like my artwork? Target shareholders, founders, uh, they own shares of, we'll call it, tar it's not target, the store target, it means target the company that the private equity group wants. Um, so investor comes along, they put money, and that's a pig, not a pig, although they might be a pig too. They put money into the company for stock, but the target shareholder says, hey, I want some of that money too. You know, I, you know I've been living on top ramen my whole life. Uh, I think I should be able to have some sirloin steak. So uh, private equity group says, okay, well, here's what we're gonna do. Um, we'll put some cash into the company, Target and Target will turn around and buy stock from you, Target shareholder, but we're gonna buy it at this really high price. Um, that creates a humongous tax problem for Target shareholders. So they say, well, okay, how about we do this? Target shareholders will sell you some of our stock. Uh, target shareholders sell some of their stock to private equity group while the private equity group is buying stock in the Target. Um, that's a problem because the founder's stock is going to be common and the investor wants preferred stock. So there's ways to deal with that. It's, you have to be super careful about it to do that in a way um, that uh, does not create an ordinary income tax event 
for the founders. Earnouts and contingencies. Um, uh, all I want to say about that is, again, we can plan into this. You can get ordinary income on that. You can get capital gains on that. I hate to be so tax intensive, but hey, that's what I do for a living. All right, and then finally, I'm going to close with some bad news. Unsuccessful exits. If you are going to be one of these zombie companies, one of these in Ray Trados shareholder litigations, um, you know, make sure you get good legal counsel because, you know, we're going to do more presentations on this as the recession deepens. Uh, but we do want you to be able to live to fight another day. And with that, I'm going to turn it back over to Jennifer. No, I'm not. I keep saying that. <laughs> I'm going to take questions. <laughs> All right. Let me uh, open up the Q&A box. Okay. Question here is, what? how many stocks or options should be um, uh, given to the CEO, the CTO role? Um, and the answer to that is, it depends, okay? It depends. Um, it, and remember that fast uh, uh, document I gave you? And, and if you go through some of the calculators, you're not gonna come up with a one size fits all answer. You need to go through a few of the calculators and they're free, they're online, they're easy to use. Uh, and they give you all this sense of objective uh, agreement. And that's what's really good about it. So it can be like this. Um, uh, how far along is the company? How active is your CTO going to be? Is he a full-time person or a part-time person? Is the CTO drawing a salary? That makes a big difference in a company. So um, it could be up to 5%, right, for an early stage company or even, a, a, even one that's a little further along, okay? But you're going to have to look, you know, going to have to do some, some calculations and see where the company is on that. All right, um, somebody asked uh, series A question mark, series B question mark. I'm not sure what the question is. Are you wondering what that is? So series A stock, of course, is the very first series of um, preferred stock that gets issued by a company to an instant, usually to an institutional investor. But it's the first series of, you know, it used to be the first series of preferred stock. Now we got series seed, you know, and, and I'll tell you why. You don't want to get too far down into the alphabet. So, so here's kind of the rule on that. Right, you do your seed financing. Um, you do your friends and family round with a PowerPoint. You know, your uncle is going to give you money based on your PowerPoint. You know, not this uncle. So all my nieces and nephews should just settle down. But um, other people's uncles are going to give them money based on their PowerPoint. Um, that's that's like a that's a friends and family round or a pre-seed round. Then you do the seed round um, based on proof of concept or a prototype. Okay, you can do an angel round for that. All right, cool. All right, the angels will give you that. Uh, and then you'll do a series A round when you get traction. That means you got customers, you have revenue, usually. That's usually what it means. And then you'll do a B round when you've shown you can scale. All right, so that's kind of the way investors think. So you, the founder, you're smart. You're sitting here in one of, one of Rob's uh, uh, webinars and you're learning all this stuff. So you know how you have to approach this and when you can approach it. So you want to time the letter of the alphabet behind your stock, right? So that's one thing. Uh, that's one of the reasons we number these things with letters. But um, the other thing is you don't want to have too many letters because if you're down, and I've seen this happen, I've seen people get all the way through the alphabet almost uh, before they actually exit. And if you're 10 years out and you're doing, you know, your series O round, I mean, or your series K round, people are going to think, what the heck is wrong with you? You know, why can't you sell this company? So founders are sensitive to this. So um, people started doing what used to be a series A round and saying, yeah, but we're not really a series A company yet. So let's, and I don't have to do a down round. God help us if somebody figures out that we're, you know, we're a little, we got the cart ahead of the horse a little bit and they make us do a down round. That means a lower value. So um, instead, we're going to call it a seed round instead of an A round. All right. And then the next round will be series A. Well, then it got even worse. And I've actually had clients do this. It's uh, kind of comical. Oh, gee, you know, uh, we're not even really a seed round yet because it's seed, you know, we're supposed to have a prototype. 
really a pre-seed round. So you go sell the exact same preferred stock that 10 years ago we called Series A preferred stock. And now it's not only seed, it's pre-seed. <laughs> so that's where the letters come from. All right, if you have questions, please put the questions into the Q&A box and I will get to them in order. Which is better, a pre-money safe or a post-money safe? The answer is, depends who you ask, okay? Depends who you ask. If you ask an investor, they're gonna like the post money safe because you, the founder, take all the dilution that comes after they put their money in. So here's the deal on post money. Uh, I'm gonna give you $100,000 with a post money cap. And let's say you got a 10 million post money cap. That means I get at least 1% of this company, no matter how much money, you know, how many safes you sell between now and then. You could sell a billion dollars worth of safes theoretically between now and then. I get 1% of that. That's my post money cap. It's lunacy, you know? The advantage of it is the investor is gonna say, yes, but at least I know how much of this company I got. And you, the founder, you should like it. You should just like it. Just shut up and like it because now you know how much of the company you've given away. Uh, on the other hand, so I'm, if I'm an investor, I like a post money safe. If I'm a founder, I like a pre-money safe for the exact same reason. It's like, look, you're getting in at today's, we're setting the cap now, and any additional money is gonna dilute all of us, not just me, the founder, is gonna dilute you too. All righty. Um, I'm a sole founder of the C Corp. To bring on a co-founder, do I issue new shares or sell some of my shares to the co-founder? Yeah, no, you do not sell some of your shares to the co-founder. Um, you issue new shares from the company. Does anybody know why? Chat me if you know why. I wanna see who's paying attention out there. So I remember the first time this dawned on me, which was 35 years ago, and I first started practicing law, the first time I got this question, this light bulb went off over my head. Like, ah, that's why we do. Yes, thank you, Michael. Tax reasons. If you, the co-founder, sell your shares to your co-founder, you just done a taxable transaction. You get taxed you know, on that transaction. On the other hand, if the company sells those shares, there's no taxable event. Nobody gets taxed because there's this code section, 1032 of the Internal Revenue Code that protects a corporation from tax on the sale of its own stock. So that's why you would do that. But the other reason, that's the tax reason. The other reason, <laughs> answering your own question, good. Keep them coming then. We, maybe you and I should just talk. I don't know, do we really need all these people around? Um, the other reason is you want the money to go into the company. You don't want it to go into the founder's hands. You want it in the company, right? So you only do that if you buy the shares from the company. Uh, okay, and here's an excellent question. It says, thanks for training us. Tough but fair question. Okay, next question. I invested in a fintech startup. Oh, but it's a long question. Share structure is uh, 18 for developer, 55 founder, and um, uh, well, I'm not that good at math, but I don't think that adds up to 100. We're expecting um, conversion in the shares holy cow, but we want to do a holding company in Singapore for tax purposes. <laughs> it's like a law school exam, geez. Um, how to keep IP ownership safely with the current share. After all that, it was like how to keep IP ownership safe. You know, you made me do all that brain damage. And I was, I was, I had my calculator out. I was writing numbers down. And the question is, you know, what color was the train that left the station? Well, um, so the, the answer is, yeah, we see a lot of, of uh, structures now. We're, this is an international world. We have people, I think, probably, I'm not, well, in fact, I know we have people from Asia here because I'm nosy listening tonight. And a lot of companies, if you have Asian investors, they're going to want to, and they might want to have an Asian holding company. So my rule of thumb on that is, you you know, your holding company is where, again, that's, you know, that's the golden rule. Whoever has the gold is going to make the rule and tell you where your holding company is going to be. And we'll put it up in Singapore or in Hong Kong or, or BVI or someplace. I do that transaction all the time. Um, so the issue uh, is a couple of them, and I hate to keep coming back from tax, but I can't help it. Uh, number one, it's almost impossible to transfer tax offshore without to transfer intellectual property and not just IP, intangible property outside the United States tax-free. It's almost impossible. It usually has to be a sale. Um, 
No one wants to believe that. I have to argue with people all the time over it, but trust me on that one. It's all, in fact, there's even deemed transfers now when you incorporate a foreign division, but we don't have to get into that. Um, so one is a tax reason. It's not impossible, but it's difficult to transfer stock in a company that owns intellectual property offshore. Not impossible, we do it all the time. We just have to jump through a whole bunch of hoops, okay? So there's tax complexity. Uh, the second thing is, yeah, uh, I think you'd rather, it depends what the intellectual property is, but keep in mind that patents are, are regional or geographic. You get a patent in every country that you need to exercise the patent in. Um, however, things like trade secrets, that's a matter, matter of contract. Um, so I'd rather, you know, be in, you know, a, a Delaware choice of law if I had a choice. Uh, plus, I like the idea of having a U.S. company. I know how the law is. I know we got a court system here that seems to work pretty well. We're probably going to find out over the next few months how well. Um, but we've got a way of enforcing intellectual property rights. I like to have ownership in a U.S. company. So if I am going to do that structure with a foreign holding company, um, unless the intellectual property is already offshore, uh, I, I think I would prefer to have Singapore company own stock and U.S. company that owns intellectual property. Now, three years ago, I never would have said that. Three years ago, the tax law was different and you never would have done that. You'd have done everything you could to get intellectual property and, and intangible property outside the United States for tax reasons. That just doesn't work very well. And by the way, since you got me started on this, see what you did. Um, if uh, Joe Biden's tax proposals go through, uh, that structure is just completely dead because he's going to end any of those sorts of international tax games. Uh, I could talk for an hour as how he gets there. It's complicated. Uh, I'm sure he doesn't himself understand it, but that's what would happen. I doubt that's going to, that's what would happen. Uh, all right, I have an LLC, been funded uh, and expect to get um, another one and a half million. I have no co-founders, well, lucky you, and no employees. I use Ven, <laughs> okay, heard this one before. You think you have no employees. Uh, I have vendors and co-researchers that have been fully paid. Uh, I own all the IP. Do you have an invention assignment? If you don't have an invention assignment from these non-employees that did all this coding, you might not own all the IP. So that's number one. I do want to get others involved as employees. How do your incentive program? Oh, here's another one. Big long question in your, your question. Your question is, again, what color was the train that left the station at six o'clock going 100 miles an hour? All right, I do want to involve other, get others involved as employees. How do your incentive programs work for them? Um, so again, um, if they're le here's my rule of thumb. This is not legal. This is just how I like to do things. If it's less than a percent, I'm going to give them an option. We're going to put in place an option plan, especially since you get money. You can get, you can get a 409A valuation, uh, um, value the stock, grant options to people, and then they have what everybody else in Silicon Valley has, and they all feel pretty good about it. If uh, they're a little more than that, we're gonna try and figure out a way to sell them some stock. Maybe they give you a promissory note so they don't have to pay today. Maybe we just grant it to them and they take the tax hit. Maybe we try to get a low valuation. Maybe we do one of my more creative structures um, that I can't talk about in public. <laughs> Actually, I talk about it all the time, whoever will listen. So um, kind of depends, but you do wanna get equity in the hands of these people. If you're a startup company, uh, that's the whole point. Have you been paying attention to anything? I mean, that's the whole presentation here. How to reward contributors. We want to incentivize people by giving them a stake. Silicon Valley was built on equity compensation. Don't, you know, it's expensive for sure, but uh, don't deny the power of stock and options. What percent of equity do we give consultants? Same thing. Go through the go through the charts. Same thing. How much are they doing? What are they doing for you? Uh, consultants are way tougher because they're just a lot harder to find on any of these charts and graphs. That's oftentimes a heavily negotiated. By the way, what happens if you get it wrong? What if it's heavily negotiated and you gave somebody, I had this happen not that long ago, this smooth talk and slick consultant talked my client into giving, giving, um, giving him 5% uh, of the company, 5%, he's a consultant. All the wonderful things that they were going to do Turned out not to do all those wonderful things, did not do them so wonderfully. How do we fix that? Well, here's how. 
if somebody turns out not to be all that, you're going to know pretty darn soon. Oh, six months, three months, certainly a year. Let's say a year. Let's let's all agree on a year. That's why that stock you gave to that consultant that they have to earn into over the next five years gets zero vesting for the first 12 months. So if they turn out to be a slacker instead of a worker, within the first year, you cut the cord, you terminate the consultant, you get all that stock back. That's how you protect yourself in that scenario. So you got a little bit of flexibility. On the other hand, um, you don't want to be an idiot about it. You want to promise them, what if they're really good, but you still gave them too much stock? So use the calculators, uh, negotiate something, ask around. It's this one, you know, it, there's a lot more art than science into that, by the way, even though we got calculators. The calculators will make you feel good about your decision. You know, think of the calculators as the opiate that the startup masses, but it's a judgment call ultimately. How do angels or uh, series investors typically value the company? You know, I've got, if you want, uh, yeah, thank you for posting my uh, my email address there, but I've got a memo that will give you 30 different ways that I've seen investors value companies. Um, and uh, I mean, we could talk a lot of, in fact, I do a whole, you know, I've got a whole thing on this. I probably should have talked about that tonight. So let's talk about it now. Um, it goes from the super sophisticated um, um, discounted cash flow methods. You know, they present value, um, uh, a discount of, you know, sometimes it's a discount to publicly traded companies. Sometimes it's comparables um, to the super unsophisticated patents plus employees times a million. I've seen that, not, not making that up. Here's the one I see most often. It's going to surprise you. And I've had VCs more than one tell me this is how we do it. It's math. How much company does this, how much money does this company need to get to the next evaluation event to scale, to launch a product, whatever? How much stock in this company do I think I should have? It's going to be somewhere between 20 and 40%. How much do I need to make this worth my while to come to those board meetings and put up with that founder and not go to the other guy's board meetings. All right, I know how much cash they need. I know how much stock I need. Poof, there's our valuation. I see that all the time. But um, just keep in mind, I have a lot of different methods, 30 that I've counted. How do I attract investors that don't control the operation just because they own some shares? Good question, Mr. Anonymous Intendi. By the way, Anonymous, I want to congratulate you. You are our best customer. I see you at all of our events. Sometimes you register numerous times. Thanks for being here. Um, well, uh, yeah, know your investors. If, and if you're getting from institutions, um, you can go online. You don't even have to go to the dark web. You can go online almost anywhere uh, and find out about them. Um, you can talk to companies they have invested in. We do a whole presentation on, you know, knowing your VC, how to negotiate with VCs. But that's a big one. Know your investor because you're married to that investor. You know, it's, it's more of a commitment than a marriage. Um, so before you take that money, make sure you know who you're dealing with. And if you think that they're control freaks, you ought to know that up front. And the best way is to talk to other founders that they fund it. Second best way is to go online and see what, you know, what, what chatter is out there. And the third way, I've talked about this before, check the dockets and see how much they've had to litigate. Um, that will stop a show quicker than anything for you. What's the best way to allocate shares to startup to contributors who help startup uh, in the early stage, sometimes before the stocks are being allocated? <clears throat> Um, well, that's an ideal situation for one of these dynamic split arrangements because the value is so low, really the only valuation metric you have is the inputs, not so much the stock that they're getting, can't even be 4 or 9A valued at that point. So that's where you might want to use that sort of system. I think it makes a lot of sense. Um, that's a place where dynamic split would work really well, you know, or a formula, any sort of formula, just, you know, just, you know, get a spreadsheet together. And again, you know, it just makes everybody feel good about the number. And that's, you know, there's a lot of psychology in this. You know, that's 80% of the battle, maybe 90%. All righty, I'm going to finish a prototype on my own, generate income to show traction before any meetings. If I'm the designer and the sales founder, so I get two positions. 
with a sales advisor, CTO get 5%. So is the balance available for investors down the road? Okay, let me summarize. Um, you're a sole founder, you're doing everything. And um, you're gonna bring on uh, an advisor to help with sales at a quarter percent. You're gonna bring on a CTO at 5%. Um, so what's available for investors? Well, here, well, okay. Good question. Thanks for asking it. I'm actually, I just had an idea. I'm going to amend my slides because we have to talk about what the investor is going to do to your company after they come in because they're going to look at that and they might say, you know, you're a little skinny on help around here. Uh, I think we ought to give 5% to a new C something O, whatever it is. And we better give another 10% to a new CEO. And we better put some stock aside for this set of you know, employees and, and scientists and designers and whatever it is. So the investors thinking about that, because you're going to see that in a term sheet, they're going to say, look, we want you to have a stock pool of X percent before we close. And the stock pool is going to be X percent post-close, but it's going to come out of your founder share before we close. So investors, and by the way, VCs invest post money, just so you know, they might phrase it pre-money, but they're thinking post money. So, um, so that's the scenario. So to say it's available for investors down the road is a little misleading because the investor is going to, you know, again, they make a pancake out of what you're doing. They're going to reshake, um, they're going to reshuffle that deck uh, and reshake that deal and uh, come up with the cap table that they think you should have. Is a company that's already developed technology and ready for market and growth, but has not taken any VC going to look like an ugly duck or a beautiful swan? Um, well, let's see. Um, why would that make you look like an ugly duck? I think it makes you look pretty darn good. If you've, if you've got technology developed, if you're ready for market and growth, uh, no, I think, you look, I think you look awesome. The real question though, that you're not telling me here though. Um, what you're really not telling me here is, um, are you scalable? And uh, you have technology and you're ready for a market growth, but how big is the market and how much can you grow? What are you gonna do with that venture capital money? Uh, how is that going to benefit you? Um, how, will, um, how will you use that? You know, are you gonna be the explosive growth you know, that Gary Jinks likes to say, uh, that's going to attract the venture capitalists. So I don't think you look like an ugly duck at all in that scenario. And again, if the VC thinks that, you know, that you're rough around the edges, you need some more personnel, you need some more of this, a little of that, you know, you're gonna have another cook in the kitchen and, um, you know, they'll make those changes. Okay, Anonymous says in exchange for invention assignment, uh, so we had a broken link. I don't know what that means. You'll have to rewrite that question. Sorry, you go to the bottom of the list. No soup for you. Uh, do you recommend a C-Corp for a sole owner? How difficult is it to convert an LLC to a C-Corp? Well, um, yeah, so 99% um, of the um, startup companies I form are, are Delaware C-Corps. We're gonna talk about that in two weeks why that is, but I will tell you that if you're going out for venture, that's what they want to invest in. So that's what we're gonna be. And if we don't get the venture investment, we're not going to survive. So it doesn't matter if we're anything else, we might as well just form as a C-Corp. Now, can we convert an LLC to a C-Corp? Yes, absolutely, we do it all the time. It's a corporate matter, it's relatively easy. It's a tax matter, eh. That depends, depends on how much stuff you've done in the meantime, but we do it all the time. Um, the benefit of course, as you know, of a limited liability company is the investors, the owners, uh, if you elect to be taxed as a partnership can get a pass through of losses that they can personally deduct if they actively participate in the entity uh, or they have one level of tax on the gain and they can pull the gain out in the form of distributions, two levels of tax on a C-Corp, once at the corporate level, once at the shareholder level, the disadvantage is qualified small business stock. We talked about that two weeks ago. We'll talk about it again in a couple of weeks. Investors love qualified small business stock. It means they don't pay any federal tax at all on gains from the sale of their stock in their company when you exit. But 
only a C Corp can issue qualified small business stock. So we have to convert that LLC to a C Corp and then let the investors come in. But we do that all the time. I do that transaction regularly. So it's not a big deal. It just means you're paying for two companies instead of one. The LLC that you form, then the C Corp that it converts into down the road. So that's the only issue with it. Is this recording? Yes, it is. That's what that little recording button at the top of your screen means, the little red dot. Uh, it is being recorded and a copy of the video is going to be circulated to everybody. What else would change under Biden? God, <laughs> talk about being baited here. Well, since you ask, um, nothing will change unless Georgia, um, unless, uh, Georgia goes blue. Uh, and if you have a Democrat majority in the Senate, then uh, uh, President-elect Biden would increase uh, the corporate tax rate from 21 to 28 percent. Um, it would increase the individual rates, um, would, uh, would impose Social Security and self-employment taxes, would remove the caps uh, for anyone making over $400,000. Uh, that could be a big number. Um, it would change the international provisions quite, quite significantly to tax back in the U.S. earnings that are locked offshore and subsidiaries. Taxes would go up. Taxes would go up on, on business. Uh, oh, there would be a limitation of some pass-through business deductions. Uh, the 199A qualified business income deduction would go away. So quite a lot would change, um, honestly. But um, that's very speculative. We won't know till January because you have to get a, a Democrat Senate. Uh, and not only if you get a Democrat Senate, then it can only, even if you get a Democrat Senate, it can only come in under what they call reconciliation, which means it has to sunset. Um, so uh, um, that's way more information than you want it to know, but you could have tax changes next year. And by the way, um, uh, if you do have tax changes, they will likely be retroactive probably to January 1. So do your plan. And here's the odd thing. We're not going to know who the Senate is until after, after then. I don't think, you know, the runoff election is until January. So you got to do your planning without having any idea what the tax law is going to do next year. And most of the companies I'm working with are assuming the worst. They're assuming the worst. They're accelerating income. They're closing their deals. They're delaying deductions, all that stuff. Uh, okay. What time we got here? Looks like we got a, where'd my time go? Got a few minutes left, I'm sure. What's the recommended, got three minutes left. Recommend a level of detail or personal investment required for an equity division plan for early friends, family. Yeah, the more detail, the better. Um, meaning that, well, okay, let me put it this way. Um, one way, uh, let me take that back. One way we often depends who you're talking about. If you're talking about if you're talking about founder level people, you want a corporation. You want a restricted stock purchase agreement with all of these provisions. You know, uh, giving sufficient direction to the parties in a full, complete agreement, standard agreements. If, on the other hand, we're talking to uh, optionees, advisors, uh, people who have relatively small amounts. Um, and you're very early, so you don't have a stock option plan yet, we can do just a very simple offer letter that says, hey, look, we're going to give you, I'm going to recommend to the board that we grant to you an option to purchase X number of shares at fair market value as soon as we get an option plan. Not a lot of detail, and it'll vest over five years, or it'll vest as determined under the option plan. Not a lot of detail. We do that all the time, and that defers all the cost. And people seem to be willing to accept that because look, if you don't get a financing, the company's not worth anything anyway, so that option won't matter. And if you do get a financing, that means here's my paper, I'm gonna get my option. So people will generally accept that deal. What if consultants wanna be paid instead of equity? Oh, so do you take cash? You do take cash, don't you? Can I give you cash? Um, back in the, the, the go-go 90s when they, during the internet boom, um, I remember I kept trying to get paid in stock and <laughs> I had a client ask me one time, he says, you do take cash, don't you? Um, yeah, I don't think you're gonna have that problem. Most consultants will take cash. Um, so would raising pre-seed money be an option to pay your consultants? Yeah, absolutely. That's a good way to do it because you can sell 
And here's why you can sell your, um, your pre-seed money is going to give up less equity in your company. Whatever investment you sell to investors will give up less equity than if you give an equal value of common stock. Tune in two weeks ago if you want to know why. How to attain a copy of your audiobook, Dead on Arrival. Email me and I'll send you a link. Um, what else we got? I never advise with lawyers. What's the fee range for consultation just to have some sense? Uh, email me, I'll let you know I've got a startup package of what you can expect based on various parameters. Uh, we are startup friendly here in Silicon Valley, but it kind of depends. That's a great question to end on. Kind of depends on um, uh, how many founders you have and how uh, fancy your capital structure is going to be. But um, like I say, we're startup friendly and I work against a startup, uh, uh, I work against a, a budget uh, and some costs. So nobody is ever surprised going in as to what things are, they shouldn't be a surprise going in as to what things are going to cost. Okay, with that, we are at 8.30 and I am going to turn this back to Jennifer for her closing remarks. That was a lot of great information, Roger. Thanks for being with us today and sharing your expertise and sense of humor. Audience members, thanks for tuning in and asking great questions. See you next time.